Uh, yes, 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 yes. What up, what up, what up? It's me, it's Bruce Hope, and I'm back with another episode of the Format Podcast. And I'm especially excited today. Not that I'm not usually excited when I'm recording the pod, but I'm especially excited today because I got another great guest for you. And on today's episode, we're going to have former NFL scout and host of the Three and Out podcast, John Middlecoff, joining to talk the NFL draft and uh, upcoming storylines, quarterbacks, and team outlooks for the upcoming 21-22 NFL season. All right? So stick around for that one. It should be a good one. But... Before we get to that, you know what it is. Let's knock out the particulars, shall we? All right. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate that. And guess what? Guess how you can show me your appreciation? You can click that like button. You can click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen. You can click on that bell so you get notified when new content's out and you never miss anything we're doing for you. And if you like, please leave me something in the comments section, okay? We like that. If you're on social media, you can catch me on Twitter at Bruce F. A. Hope. That's at Bruce F. A. Hope. You can also catch me on Instagram at The Format Podcast. That's at The Format Podcast. Okay. You can also uh, email me directly. Email address is uh, The Format Podcast at Outlook.com. The Format Podcast at Outlook.com. Okay. So, what you can do on YouTube, you can leave comments on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you can email me directly. You can use any of those um, ways to reach me. You can tell me, Bruce, you are the biggest idiot talking sports. You don't know what you're talking about. You can tell me, Bruce, I love what you have to say. Your stuff is awesome. It doesn't matter what you say. You can write, say mean things. You can write, say mean, uh, great stuff. It doesn't matter because you know why? Whatever you do, that lets me know you're listening and I'm cool with that. All right. So just let me know you're listening. All right. Um, next up. If you just want the uh, audio version, the podcast version, so you can listen while you drive, while you're moving around town, while you're cooking, cleaning, doing whatever it may be, doing work in the yard, building stuff. If you're a carpenter, you're handy, whatever it is you may be doing and you just want to listen, that's cool too. Because before I started putting out this YouTube content, I was putting out the podcast in purely audio form and you can find that anywhere your podcasts are listened to. Overcast, Stitcher, Podbean. Google Podcast, uh, iTunes, whatever it may be, wherever you get your podcast, just type in the format podcast will pop right up. We'll be right there. You can subscribe and listen to me. And by the way, as we're mentioning iTunes, if you're going to listen on iTunes, go ahead and rate and review, rate and review, rate and review. Please do that for me. And if you're going to do that, give me that five star rating. One, two, three, four, five, 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 five. Give me that five star rating. Okay. It uh, definitely helps us move up in the rankings and uh, lets me continue to make this uh, great content for you, okay? So please give me that five-star review. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to click that bell. We're going to click the subscribe button. We're going to leave something in the comments. We are going to uh, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, or email, right? We're going to do all that. We're going to subscribe on your audio podcast platform, and you're going to leave me that five-star review. So with all that said and done, let's go ahead and get to John Middlecoff. But how are we going to do that? The same way we always do. We're going to sit back, relax, and listen up to episode 98. Two episodes left until the magic number 100 of the format. Joining the format podcast today, another great special guest, 
former NFL scout and current host of the Three and Out podcast on the Herd Podcast Network, John Middlecoff. John, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Can't complain at all. Got some great football talk to get to and, and excited to hear your takes on uh, some of these things that we talk about. Yeah, so, it's a uh, beautiful spring day. Rock absolutely. and roll, baby. Yeah. So let, let's start out, obviously, with the NFL draft, which uh, just took place about a week and a half ago. Um, and this is something that's kind of been interesting to me since I started listening to you um, break things down um, before the, 20, the 2020 draft. And one of the things that you said that really stuck out to me was there should be no argument. The SEC has the best players, hands down. And being a person, I've kind of I've lived in the footprint of every Power Five conference now, except for the Pac-12. And so I kind of um, that, that that's not something I necessarily subscribe to, you know, without argument. Um, so this past draft, the SEC set the record for draftees from a single conference again with 65, broke their own uh, record. But what I thought was interesting, and this is something I've talked about ad nauseum, the conference is extremely top heavy, like most conferences, but with 65 draftees, more than half of those came from four schools, uh, 34 from Bama, LSU, Florida, and Georgia. And so I'm not that impressed with the conference on a whole. And where I'm going with this is, you got a school like Notre Dame, who is a very good program, and but not known for having the best athletes in college. Often you see that kind of play out when they get on the field against the top tier schools. Um, and so they matched Georgia with nine selections this past draft. So I'm wondering, is there kind of some group think among NFL scouts and G, uh, and uh, GMs and, and so forth, front office people in terms of SEC players and their value? Yeah. I I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think Notre Dame's viewed as an NFL powerhouse. You know, I think Clemson would fall under that, Ohio State. You know, every every team is its own individual entity. But I think when you look at as a whole, just the last decade, you know, what Mississippi State did when Dan – you know, a college program, obviously the South, it just feels in general, right? And you throw Clemson, Miami, Florida State. I know they're down, but you know what I'm saying. NC yeah. State's had a pretty good run. There's just more consistent talent because Texas is more likely to go, you know, east, right, as a kid. E e that might be Oklahoma, too, but, like, head that way than come to California. And, obviously, Florida is really the east coast California when it's producing talent. And the one thing you've seen the last, I'd say, when I was a kid, like DJ Williams, I guess I was probably in junior high. You remember he's a, went to Miami, mm -hmm. started at a De La Salle. So they've always been a big guy or two out West that would head to the national programs. Mm -hmm. But like Najee Harris grew up 15 minutes away from me and went right. to Alabama. Right. And I think you just saw the, the linebacker who transferred from Tennessee to Alabama. He's mm -hmm. a De La Salle guy. Right. So now the SEC's become so cool because they're winning all these national championships and they're on television. So the California guy is kind of drifting that way. Now, you know, 15 years ago, Pete Carroll was kind of that guy, right? Mm -hmm, so it's it's mm -hmm. cyclical for sure. But I think right now the SEC, Alabama is getting the best players all over the country. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're picking and choosing. And I think mm -hmm. Georgia is doing that as well. And I think Florida with Dan Mullen will do that also. I, I hear you, like the bottom, you know, rung of the conference is hit or miss. But they are still like Kentucky a couple of years ago, produced a ton of NFL guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi State had a long run under Dan Mullen from Dak Prescott's to, you know, Darius Slay to mm -hmm. Fletcher Cox. So it, I don't think it'll stay this way forever. Obviously, Nick Saban is the driving force, but right. that doesn't mean that if you go into Oregon or Notre Dame that you go, well, they're not as good as the SEC. That's not necessarily the case. But I, I do believe as a whole, like the Pac-12, I'm a West Coast guy, mm -hmm. and I, it's clearly just down. Right. I mean, right, just from right. the, and a part of it is because we're losing our players, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, Najee Harris, when I was like in the nineties would have gone to USC, UCLA or Oregon or mm -hmm. met Washington when I was really young was a power. That's just, he would not have gone to Alabama. Maybe he would have gone to like Notre Dame or something, but he would not have left the probably left the West coast. And that's just something that you could argue like society, it's just become, you know, the book world is flat or whatever a couple decades ago, but definitely now with the internet, it's much easier to be like, damn, I want to go to Clemson. Their backup quarterback last year, DJ 
when mm-hmm. Trevor got Corona, he's an yeah. LA guy. He's a California kid. Yeah. So think about that. Najee Harris, DJ, DJ might be the number one overall pick in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. He just would have been at from, from Southern California. He would have been at SC, right. Or, or maybe Oregon, but he definitely wouldn't have been at Clemson. Right. So I, I just think it's just kind of the way the tide is going right now. Now it doesn't mean it stays that way forever. Cause we, and I get arrogant sometimes about California football. We do produce a lot of guys. Yeah. But we got to keep them. Mm-hmm. If Alabama, if LSU, if Georgia, you know, I give Clemson credit, Ohio State, Notre Dame. I mean, uh, the the guy, the Niners drafted in the second round, Banks, the guard. He's from he's from yep. El Cerrito, which is right next to Berkeley. Mm-hmm. I mean, that guy. How, how's that guy getting out of the state? And right. so I, Notre Dame, Brian Kelly has a lot of respect in the league. You know, so I, I think they're more of an outlier program, but they also aren't part of a conference. Right, right. And right. you put them in the ACC, for example, this year. Mm-hmm. And beside Clemson, they kicked everyone's ass. Yep. So, I mean, they're, they're just an elite, probably top five or six program. I think most scouts, when they go through, there might be a bias, but I think the bias is more toward like us out West than it is Oklahoma gets respect. You know, mm-hmm. look at Michigan. They had a bunch of guys drafted and their mm-hmm. team stunk. So right. I, 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 I do think, I think that we talk about it on the outside, the SEC probably more than like the NFL necessarily does. Cause like okay. you said, I mean, three or four programs mm-hmm. and LSU has always been that way, whether they have a 15 and 0 season or this year they were bad, but they've always had loaded rosters. Right. right? I mean, I don't think you'd argue right. that right. Georgia, no, LSU, Florida. And now that Alabama's like, they, they just are producing, I mean, top flight players. And I think Saban mm-hmm. is a good example of, Probably at the beginning of the decade, it was like, you know, does he run his guys, you know, ragged? Are they out of juice by the time they get Mm -hmm. to the pros? That's not really the case the last three or four years. And I think part of that is more skill guys now, Mm -hmm. uh, probably less like just D tackles and more like, you know, he produces offensive tackles, running backs who can catch now, quarterbacks. So he's just produced different type players than he definitely did early on in the decade. Fair enough. Um. So one thing I looked at kind of in uh, going along with this line of questioning is that um, I checked out pro football focus for 2020 and according to PFF um, top five player rankings per position groupings, SEC players in general don't dominate any of those particular position groups other than running backs for 2020. So I, I took what I, and you can disagree with this if you like, I took it what I looked at as the four most important position groupings in modern NFL football. Quarterback, of course, um, offensive line, but mainly tackles, edge rusher, and wide receiver. Um, would you agree that those are probably the four most important position groupings? You said quarterback, O-line, quarterback, D-line? tackle, edge rusher, and wide receiver. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. So with that, I looked at them, and out of the 20 players in those four position groupings, the SEC only produced five of those. The Big Ten actually produced six, and that led – um, all the major conferences among those major position groupings. So I just thought that was a kind of interesting note, again, with the kind of what you hear. I, I, I do, th- I do SEC, think the SEC. Big the Big Ten, though, is viewed not quite like the SEC just because mm-hmm. they're not winning national championships, right. but definitely the second power, power five. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know? And what, what I think is interesting with that real quick, too, is that we talk about the national championships in the SEC, but really it's it's Bama. Yeah. Other than LSU last year, what Bama's got six under Saban now. So it's not even really like the conference itself is winning all these championships. They are by virtue of Bama being in the conference. You know what I mean? But it's just interesting. But but he, but he does lift the relevance of the conference and the recruiting in the conference. So to me, he helps. That's where I'd say like, okay, you can't go to Bama, but like if Florida or Georgia is interested, if you're Mm -hmm. a kid from Arizona or California, right you've watched them play Alabama. You're like, that's badass. And then you get to yeah. go out there on a recruiting visit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably pretty sweet, you know, I'd agree. and that's where I think, Cle- and I think Clemson's a good example. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in, in a weird way, Alabama has helped just because they've had kind of this rivalry with Clemson and mm-hmm. played a couple of times, almost lift them as well. You know, it just made the South cool for guys that aren't from the South. Fair enough. So uh, taking number one pick Trevor Lawrence out of the equation, because most people believe he's a generational talent. So let's kind of put him to the side right now. Who do you see having the most long-term success in the NFL, a quarterback out of the other top four guys who got drafted being Trevor, uh, 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 Trey Lance, Justin Fields, uh, Zach Wilson, and Mac Jones? I think you would just have to bet on Trey Lance, given that he's going to a good team and he's got Kyle Shanahan. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just a pretty good landing spot for any rookie mm-hmm. quarterback. Now, I'd say he also has the biggest chance to not be good, right? Mm-hmm. He's only a one-year starter, small school. Right. You would definitely say the Bears' history of quarterbacks is not great. Like that franchise, is, it's a tough place. Now, mm-hmm. the fans, to me, that's an easy landing spot. Everyone's rooting for him because they feel like God gifted them this guy that should have got my top five. Right. You know, I, I actually think it's pretty crazy, a guy of his talent – and physical attributes, right? He's over six three. He can fly. He's he's produced. He's accurate, mm-hmm. uh, and he's got a big arm. Like mm-hmm. that's just a big time prospect. My mm-hmm. my comp always was more like uh, probably a much better version in college of like Donovan McNabb, mm-hmm. like just a physical that's freak fair. who just you know like any college kid. There's probably things you have to work on, but mm-hmm. who would not want to work with that guy? Yeah. I you know and and ultimately I get the Niners chose. You know, to me, Trey Lance and Justin Fields have some similarities, both mm-hmm. just physically extremely gifted, and the Niners just chose one over the other. Mm-hmm. But I'm shocked that, like, Denver passed on them. Car- mm-hmm. I mean, Carolina, I like Sam Darnold, but I probably I would have thought it long and hard about that, or someone didn't yeah. trade up to get him. I mean, hell, I, I know they're kind of financially tied to Matt Ryan, but that, that'll be something that we'll keep a close eye mm-hmm. on for years to come because, you know, eventually Kyle Pitts can't throw it to himself, mm-hmm. right? Uh so, and then Mac Jones, like their team is clearly much better, right? He signed a bunch of guys. He was aggressive in the draft for the first time. And I, regardless what you, th- I mean, he's Bill's a big time coach. And so is Josh, but he's from the South. Alabama's not a cold weather place. New England's really cold. That. He's not yeah. a big arm guy. Like that's right. why I like Justin Fields, you know, at Chicago, he's a big mm-hmm. arm guy. So it when fits. If it does fit, could Jay yep. Cutler fit there, right? I mean, just mm-hmm. the physical attributes. Mm-hmm. Mac Jones is more of like a Matt Ryan, Kirk Cousins type guy. Yeah. Cousins is having success in a dome. Matt right. Ryan in a dome. Right. Like it, right. part of what made Brady so elite is like he yearned for snow and sleet. To me, that was a huge differentiating factor. Like him and him and Manning were like equals, but then mm-hmm. Brady just he was just way better outside. Incredible cold weather. Cold Incredible weather. cold weather. And think about in the AFC. Kansas City, Buffalo, Baltimore, mm-hmm. Pittsburgh. It's a cold weather conference. Yep. New England, just the Jets. Mm-hmm. You just end up playing a lot of these games. You know, I mean, you've lived in the East Coast. It gets yeah. cold, man. Yeah, absolutely. I lived in Philly. That's why it's hard for us, like Jared Goffs, the Derek Cars, mm-hmm. guys that are used to that type of weather. Part of like Aaron Rodgers, he got to just live in Green Bay and be mm-hmm. in Green Bay. Even Brady from the Bay got to be in Michigan for four or five years. So you do get acclimated to wherever you live in Florida now, right? You just get used to the heat, right? You just get, you just become, you know, we're just the animal instincts of humans. You just become used to your surroundings. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard. Like you practice in LA or the South Trevor Lawrence, like it's going to be hard for when Trevor Lawrence plays his first game against like the jets in late December or whoever. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 It's going to be a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something to keep an eye on. I like Mac Jones. I did not think he was like, I don't think he fell in the draft. I still think he was overdrafted, but he went to I agree. a good spot. I agree. He had, he also had the advantage of just elite uh, schemes offensively and defensively in college with Saban and um, Sark, as well as just uh, out of this world weapons that most teams just couldn't match up with and deal with. But I, I, I do it. think too, on what you said about the wide receiver group, I think for a long period of time, the SEC was much more ground and pound play defense. Yes. yes which clearly the last couple drafts has shifted, right? Mm-hmm. A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, mm-hmm. all the Bama guys, Justin yep. Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Yep. So like that is a group to keep an eye. That could shift a little bit because those guys, I mean, probably four out of the, you know, hell, five, six out of the ten of them are going to be. D.K. and A.J. are already sweet. Yep. Justin Jefferson was awesome. Mm-hmm. At minimum, probably over the next five years, two of the four Bama guys are going to be good. So at that the Bama just the SEC is just getting much more pass happy, mm-hmm. which is going to benefit that position group and their quarterbacks. Right, right? they're just going to start right. producing more quarterbacks to get drafted higher. Right. Um. I, I also was uh, uh pretty surprised at the uh, Justin Fields slip, as you mentioned. Um. Just looking at it, I having watched him play a fair amount as well as Trevor Lawrence. To me, I thought that he was the more accurate tight window passer than Trevor Lawrence. The ACC has been terrible for like the last five years. Awful. Trevor Lawrence receivers are always running free. And yeah. I think just watching um, uh, Justin Fields and, and watching how he can really thread the needle. People got on him for the bad game against Northwestern, for getting Northwestern at the number one pass defense in the country. 
and they're getting on him. But then he goes and treads Clemson, and you can make the argument that two games against Clemson, he outplayed uh, Trevor Lawrence twice. But it is what it is, and I think he's in a good spot with Mac, Matt Nagy, who's a very solid offensive coach, and he can probably do a lot – not probably. He can do a lot more things than – Trubisky and Nick Foles could. I I think it's going to be all right there for him. I think the Trevor Lawrence thing is is just you know he's almost six six. Mm. He does have a big arm. Like he, his traits, if you were just translating, are pretty awesome. He can run too. Mm. Uh, like he he has physical attributes that mm. definitely as he gets thicker, he's just he checks a lot of boxes. Like the NFL doesn't get as caught up in like awards and hype and like that, like that we do on the outside. It, mm-hmm. It's, it's really more about traits. And that is kind of, again, I disagree like you do where just fields when I think he has a chance to really make a lot of people look pretty stupid. Mm-hmm. Hell the jets. I mean, I mean, Zach Wilson is not as close to as physically gifted as Justin Fields. Right. Right. So who do you see um, as the most impactful non quarterback rookie this season? It's a good question. I mean, it's it's probably more likely a team closer to the twenties, right? Because they're usually pretty good, and that guy just plays. Mm. So if you if you look at the twenties, you know, I I mean, if the Steelers at one point in time it felt like we're going to go undefeated, but then Roethlisberger kind of right. fell apart. Like Najee, right. like James Connor's an awesome story, right? Overcoming mm. cancer, yeah. it's hard not to root for the guy. But I, you know, he was a mid late. I mean, he's not some big time NFL talent. Stealing. And yeah. when they when they had Le'Veon to go with the passing game, they were pretty unstoppable. Mm-hmm. And Najee's pretty awesome. <laughs> like mm-hmm. to me, Najee well rounded back. Like he he's got a chance to really just kind of stabilize them. Mm-hmm. And the Ravens are just really good. So I mean, they just drafted yeah. multiple first round guys, right? The mm-hmm. wide receiver from Minnesota. Rashad uh, Bateman. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Yeah. So you put him with Hollywood, with Mark Andrews. They signed mm-hmm. Sammy Watkins. They already have a sweet running game with Lamar mm-hmm. and and uh, and J.K. You're kind of cooking, right? Mm-hmm. So, And, they, they, you know, Tennessee, the staff got blown out. They add T. Martins, their wide receiver coach. So maybe just right away, like, that guy could have an impact. It's just easier to have a big-time impact. I think you saw it with D.K. a couple years ago mm-hmm. when you're on a really good team. I mean, yeah. not saying that like bad teams don't have rookies no, that make plays, but mm-hmm. it's more important when you're winning, and it's it's harder to impact winning on good teams because you're playing other good teams for playoff seating, right? So right. I, I would look in the twenties. All the the dude uh, that the Colts drafted, the defensive lineman from Mi- Michigan. Who do you pay? Yeah, so you put him right next to you know DeForest Buckner, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden that defense mm-hmm. is already pretty good. Right. Uh, to me, Carson. You know, you now kind of can with Jonathan Taylor, that offensive line. We're, that that we're team could be to that. Yeah. That team could be pretty good, man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um to 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 kind of give my thoughts on that question real quick. Two guys that I really uh see obviously um Demar Chase obviously being reunited with Joe Burrow. If of course they can keep Joe Burrow standing, that can be a dangerous one two punch. And we saw what uh Jefferson did last year in Minnesota, and he was the number two guy on that LSU championship team. So Jamar Chase is one. And the other guy I really see, and I'm kind of biased here because I am a huge Notre Dame fan for about 30 years now. I can tell. Is Yeah, is uh, JOK, um, Jeremiah Wusu kormoa because I think he's put in a position where that defense is strong. Now they've built it up on the back end with the defensive backs. The front four is awesome. And now he's in a position in the linebacking core where if he can stay healthy and if he can pick things up on the NFL level, he can just run and make plays, see ball, get ball. And he's that type of player. We saw it in the first game against Clemson. We saw it all year with him winning the uh, the Buckus Award. He is the kind of guy that just – he can cover receivers in the slot. He can cover tight ends. He can kind of be everywhere all over the field. And I think he has a chance to be really impactful. Your thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, I people that – you know, obviously some of the mock drafts had him go in the first round. The, mm-hmm. the league liked him. Mm-hmm. To me, my friends just had him in the second round. Now, okay. obviously, you, when you go at the end of the second round and people had, had mocked you as a top 20 pick, I think mm-hmm. it was pretty alarming. But I, part of being a draft pick, right, you want to go to a place where you can succeed. I mean, that team is loaded. He gets loaded. to play. He's a run-and-hit guy. And I saw that their defensive coordinator, who was with the 49ers with Fred Warner, who mm-hmm. went in the third round and who's now easily one of the better middle linebackers. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just put on an extra 10 pounds once you get to the league, you, you know, eating consistently. Mm-hmm. It's harder in college just in general, mm-hmm. even at a pro, even at the best programs. 
I guess probably beside Alabama. I don't know what they're right. feeding them, but right, uh, right. Notre Dame's feeding the linemen pretty good. Yeah, but you know, some and some you. guys it's just harder to put on because what was the problem? Like he weighed two hundred twenty pounds, not two hundred forty. Wasn't that yeah? Kind of but he, he comes in at the same weight as the guy from uh, Indianapolis, uh, the All Pro linebacker Ken Darius Leonard. That. Darius Leonard, right? And that's what I thought about um, during the draft process when I'm hearing the weight might be a concern. I'm like, well. He's weighing in right like Darius Leonard, and he is a guy who is outstanding in coverage at the linebacker. But he's a Swiss Army knife guy. Yeah, I think sometimes, like, if you can play, you can play, right. right? If you can do a job, regardless of in any industry, what your resume is or what you've done before, like, I, I think we can overvalue that. I heard Jonathan Vilma once say when he was coming out, the knock on him is he was too small. Yep. Yep. And he made play, I think he was like 217 or something. Mm-hmm. And he bulked up for the combine or his pro day. Yep. And Herm Edwards told him like, bro, I want you to play like the guy I saw at the U. Yep. But, and sometimes the U was so powerful and he was so dominant that he right. still ended up going high. But I think sometimes like we overvalue that stuff in the draft process mm-hmm. to, you know, a four, five, two, instead of a four, four, eight, you know, mm-hmm. it's like 217 pounds instead of 228 pounds. And mm-hmm. some, but sometimes it does impact. Right. And the guy that is a limitation for whatever reason. But this in this situation, especially the way the league is now, Mm -hmm. probably won't matter. Like I I ran into Bill Romanowski the other day and we were just talking like back in his day in the 80s and 90s, like linebackers needed to take on the guard. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I played with Matt Millen and he's like that guy. No one could rock a guard like him. Mm. Linebackers ain't rocking guards anymore. Like the, the, the game is spread it's more sideline to sideline. It right. really is more team speed. Ideally, yeah, you'd want Luke Keekley, you know, 245 pounds mm-hmm. who can go downhill and sideline to sideline. He's a once a t- every decade. Like, so that right. guy, I think Fred Warner is a great example of a guy a little smaller. When you can run, you can really play in today's league. Fair enough. So let's take it from uh, from draft talk and let's get to some more established players in the league. Let's, let's talk quarterbacks. Obviously, the biggest name um, right now in, in, in the quarterback situation, Aaron Rodgers. Do you see him being in the Packers uniform next year? What are you hearing from your connections in the league? And if not, what do you see as the most likely destination? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I haven't really heard anything beside what people have heard. I don't, I don't know anybody with Green Bay, but mm. uh, I, I, I would struggle to trade him. <laughs> I don't know that. Yeah. You know, you just – you only get so many all-time great players mm-hmm. when you're a GM, and it's it's – no matter how ugly it gets, right, you just – it's one of those situations like in a relationship, if you get a divorce, you know, like if you're truly not happy, but in sports, it's like you not only will not upgrade, like you will almost guaranteed to downgrade and that will cost you your job. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I would just do everything humanly possible to make it happen. I I've been saying, I, I know financially this isn't fantasy football, but I would try to find a way to land Julio Jones. You know, if I was the Packers, that means cutting a player to make mm-hmm. some room. But then all of a sudden you could just be like, listen, Aaron, we'll guarantee your salary. We got you Julio to go with Devonte and Aaron Jones. We already were, you know, arguably we were right there with Tampa, right? Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we've been to back-to-back NFC championships. Our team is stacked. The NFC is not as good, especially the NFC North as good as a lot of divisions throughout football and definitely in the AFC. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would just be trying to uh, mend that fence fast. Right. But, you know, Aaron, the, the reality is sometimes with older athletes, especially now, they're richer than they've ever been. So once they feel something, like it's not about necessarily money. He has an unlimited amount of money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If he feels the way he feels, like, you know, and he's already a stubborn guy. I don't know about you, but I, I'm a little stubborn. Sometimes it's hard for me to change my mind. Yeah. I can't imagine if I didn't need anyone's money. Right. I would de- I would never change my opinion. Yeah. So I, it's, it's definitely, I don't think it's a story that's going away. Like Seattle clearly like, what was Seattle going to do? Trade Russell Wilson. (laughs) And they clearly went out and they got aggressive and made him a little Mm -hmm. happier. And now, now they're all kumbaya. Right. Right. I do think green Bay has been simmering kind of weird. Also they drafted a quarterback in the first round. Mm -hmm. Like that's just kind of weird. Right. Even, even though it was kind of justified, you know, I didn't think he was playing as well when they did it. So the problem is he just, flip back the switch and <laughs> dominated the league yeah I, I read i think this morning that uh they have offered him a, a large um uh adjustment on his contract or, yeah. a large amount of, they did the numbers didn't come out but i'm curious to see how that plays out he makes like 38 million dollars the thing when you're a quarterback and you're good 
Mm-hmm. Whether your contract's guaranteed or not, like, what are they going to do? Get rid of them? Like, yeah, no. Right. The, the thing with a quarterback, unlike every other position, is when they sign the real deal, like it says like five years, 200 million, but it's only mm-hmm. 100 guaranteed. Right. 99% of them see every penny. It's mm-hmm. the one position where they play it out. Like even Carson Wentz, he was ter- he's still so- seeing every penny. Jared Goff, mm-hmm. they, they don't. Right. Like the Dominic and Sue, the moment Miami could get off, they, they cut them. Mm-hmm. That's not the way with quarterbacks. Right. Um, okay, so uh, moving on from Aaron Rodgers, what do you see from Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia this season? He doesn't have a great roster around him, but it seems to me like the Eagles are willing to give him a real shot to keep the job and be the guy there. Are you hearing anything um, about him in terms of development that might give you some idea of what we might uh, see from him on the field this season? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell. I, I guess, you know, OTAs are going to happen, so they're going to have practice soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, they obviously adding Devonte Smith can't hurt. They, mm-hmm. they played together before they drafted Jalen Rager last year. So that's back-to-back years with two first round picks. Mm-hmm. Ertz is still on the team. Dallas Goddard's on the team. Miles Sanders from Penn state's a really right. dynamic player. I mean, they do have mm-hmm. weapons, right? They're weapons. Even if you think Rager, Rager is talented. So it's like, they do have a group of speed tight ends. Their offensive line's a little bit of a question mark, mm-hmm. but I didn't like them at all coming out. You know, when I, when I watched him in college, even with Lincoln Riley, I, I thought he was much more of a running back because he was an f- unreal runner. He ran like a running back. His body mm-hmm. type, uh, his, his movements, he threw it better than I thought he would. You know, I mean, I, I was, you know, I, I would not have drafted him to like the fourth round as really mm-hmm. just like a project, just like an athlete like they do in college. But clearly he, I think he resonated way more with his teammates than Carson Mm-hmm. Uh, now he, his, he was pretty hit or miss in the games he played. Now, like you said, their, their team was just in shambles, mm-hmm. but you know, it, it's a big year for him. It's not, it's not like he was a fifth. I mean, he's a second round pick, so he's going to get an opportunity with this new coach. I mean, his backup's Joe Flacco. So there's no competition. And then the thing is they do have three first round picks next year, you know, cause they're going to get one from Carson Wentz. They got one mm-hmm. from the dolphins and they have their own. So even if they are a disaster, you know, I think the kind of the thing to keep an eye on is Deshaun Watson and that whole situation, even though that's kind of got weird. But yeah. you just, you know, we've seen things get weird before and guys mm-hmm. come back, right. you know. So I, you, you just never say never with any guy, especially talented players, right? I mean, Alden mm-hmm. Smith <laughs> was gone for five years. He right. came back, you know, mm-hmm. so you just, especially quarterbacks. Right. I, I think Jay, I think Jalen has to kind of earn his spot. And the one thing yeah. you say about the NFC East, it's not very good. No. Right. I mean, Dallas is pretty flawed. Washington's going to depend on Fitzpatrick and the Giants have a quarterback problem. So all, all the teams have, I guess Dak's not a quarterback problem, but their defense is. Mm-hmm. And then the other teams have major question marks at quarterback. So that, that division, hell, it might take seven wins to win it. Right. Um, to your point, I didn't believe in Jalen Hurts either when he was at Alabama. When he got with, as you mentioned, Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma, I saw a lot more from him than I expected to see. And that allowed me to believe that he did have the chance to be legitimately successful at the quarterback position in the NFL, obviously in the right situation, coaching wise, et cetera, et cetera, scheme schematically. Um, So yeah, I think now that maybe he doesn't have to look over his shoulder, we'll we'll see what he can do. Um, Should be interesting. Again, though, he's in a bad spot with with a a brand new first time head coach. So that's going to be interesting. Not sure. How yeah, I mean, if that guy, if the coach is over your head or over his head, then it doesn't even matter. Right, right. So let's talk about uh, Jalen Hurts' former uh, teammate at the quarterback position, Carson Wentz. You mentioned him earlier. He's now in Indianapolis. He's reunited with his former offensive uh, coordinator in Frank Reich. Frank Reich, excuse me, as his head coach. Tough He's name got to a strong say. O line now. Say again. Tough name to say because it looks <laughs> like something different than it says. I always yeah, screw it no. Up. Um, <laughs> I've been watching Frank Reich since uh, University of Maryland and then uh, Buffalo. But anyway, um, he's got the O-line now. Um, He's got a great run game, as you mentioned, with Jonathan Taylor, who I think is just an absolute stud. I said uh, that. I said that last year before the draft. Watched him all three years at at Wisconsin. But um, do you see him, him being Carson Wentz, returning to form this season in a new environment with a guy that he knows as his coach and is comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, there's not a better landing spot. Mm-hmm. They, like you said, they have all the pieces around him. Mm-hmm. He can kind of take a deep breath 
Indy is just a much more mellow place than Philly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but they are very passionate about football and that team once Peyton created kind of a beast, like that's a big deal in that town. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Chris Ballard's really good at his job. Michael mm-hmm. Pittman. I love Michael Pittman. Right. So you got Pittman and Jonathan Taylor to go along. They re-signed TY. Mm-hmm. They, they just, you know, the division Houston stinks. Jacksonville's really young. They're not going to be that right. good. So it's just in Tennessee, like we'll see if they're able to maintain it. It's going to be difficult. I mean, they're going to be solid, but are they going to be like they've been one of powerhouse teams in the AFC? I think they can come back to earth a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so it's to me that division is the Colts to win because Carson, it, it's hard to see him being as crappy as he was last. I mean, he was terrible. He, he mm. really was. Uh, now, part of it, the pressure, the team, we can make excuses, but you can make like the, that's not the, what the NFL is. It's not an excuse leak. Either no, get it it's done. Not. He, he was awful. Mm-hmm. And I was a huge Carson fan. And I, I still think even when he was terrible, his physical gifts are special, mm-hmm. but he just can't, the hero ball thing, you got to cut that out. Right. Cause that, that'll get any quarterback, like learn to take sacks, learn to throw the ball away. Like that's not learn to play another down. That's the number one thing. Any coach I'm sure preaches at every level, but if you're not listening to the coach, it doesn't necessarily matter. So you just hope that he'll listen to Frank. And it's just a pretty stable organization. I I think the Colts are just an impressive operation. (laughs) They they really are. Fair enough. So last on the uh, quarterback front, Lamar Jackson, he's got a unanimous Mm -hmm. MVP. Uh, He finally got his first playoff win last year. But it looked at times like he regressed from the MVP season that he had a couple of years ago. Um, Baltimore went out and got him more weapons for the passing game. As you mentioned, Rashad Bateman, they signed Sammy Watkins. They still have uh, uh, Hollywood Brown, um, a quality guy coming off the bench, uh, red zone receiver, Miles Boykin. Um, what does the Raven coaching staff and Lamar need to do to improve a passing game that was pretty much last in the NFL in 2020? I, I think it's hard to work on a deficiency when you don't focus on it. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I don't know what they do in practice, but in football, you really get better in games. And they just, they roll with the run game as they should, because it always works. And then when they get in these tight games against better competition, they're not used to in high leverage spots, passing the ball. Mm -hmm. It's why I've been saying for like the last year and some of their blowout wins or when they get, they should just, instead of run out, like work on the passing game. Mm -hmm. And I, I clearly, I'm sure they, they have periods in practice where they do, but Lamar just, he's kind of hit or miss. Right. And you could, we can blame the, the wide receivers, but outside the numbers, he just has to be better for mm-hmm. them to beat Mahomes and Josh Allen. Cause clearly they have a really good team and he is a really special player. But like, you know, I, I was around Michael Vick who had some similarities to Lamar. You just, and he, his accuracy could be a little hit or miss, but you were pretty confident when he let it rip down the field, like he could make it happen outside the numbers Mm -hmm. where that's just been something with Lamar. I don't think he really scares defensive coordinators right now doing Mm -hmm. that. Not that he doesn't have the arm. I think he's proven that it's that he's just not going to hit him. You Mm -hmm. know, he's just going to be off and they just have to find a way. I I, I just think when you commit kind of to their, collegiate kind of run scheme that works in the NFL and mainly because of Lamar it's hard to just find a rhythm in that offense I mean I I was someone who didn't like Lamar at all coming out I thought he was inaccurate his games you know in Louisville I I didn't see it and he's blown me away Mm -hmm. he has been way better than I thought and you just can't not watch his like attitude after losses like he is just everything you can ask for in an NFL player Mm -hmm. and so to me whenever you have that type of attitude you got something to work with. And that's why I think the Ravens love the guy and they keep adding around him. I mean, I, not what else, what are their other options, but it wouldn't shock me to see improved outside the numbers throwing this year. But mm-hmm. I do, I don't think you can just randomly flip a switch, you know, at the end of the season. Right. So you just like the one thing, Josh Allen or Mahomes or just the other guys that got to beat in the AFC, they get used to throwing the ball. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, they just throw the ball. That's the one thing you see with Tannehill. Like they're so run heavy. And then he gets in a tight game. It's like, do you really trust him to throw? Like when you get into a throwing contest, it's hard. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he has like now really excuses this year. Cause they do have some talent, mm-hmm. you know, now on outside the numbers. So here's a question. This is a guy who led the league in touchdown passes two years ago. So one would assume that he some of them, came, a lot of them came though in blowouts. Okay, you know, in that Monday night game, some of those layup throws mm-hmm. to the Rams. I think you got to be careful with just a straight 
production line. You mm-hmm. see it sometimes mm-hmm. in the draft. A dude has yeah. like 12 sacks, and seven of them came when he was unblocked. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying Lamar, all of his touchdowns were right. like, give me touchdowns, but I bet if we really broke it down, you know, how many of them were what you'd really need to do to beat the best teams. Cause I just remember mm-hmm. watching them thinking like some of these teams, they were killing people, right? You know, right. Killing people. Mm-hmm. The and Browns was- and Bengals sucked that year too. Yes, they did. And, and that was something that I was kind of uh, going to ask you about was more of that production schematic, because if we noticed a lot of that, a lot of that was to the touchdown uh, to the tight ends in this, in the seam, a lot of those similar type of plays. And I noticed that, you keep referencing outside the numbers and that is where he seems to struggle. So is that him or do we think it's schematic? Well, I think Mark Andrews has been their best receiver like mm-hmm. the last couple of years, right? He's yeah. an awesome player. I mean, they mm-hmm. nailed, right. They took Hayden Hurst. They took him and they got rid of Hayden Hurst because he mm-hmm. lapped him. Well, eventually if you just got one guy that I fear, these defensive coordinators are all making over a million dollars. I mean, most mm-hmm. of them make like two, like they're just going to take that. They're going to make it harder for Mark Andrews, mm-hmm. whether it's hitting him at the line whether it's bracket coveraging them, it's whether it's doing just all they do. They're just throwing a bunch of different stuff at them. So ultimately it forces Lamar to go other places. And if I was in fairness, like Hollywood, just when you watch Hollywood, you go, God, it doesn't look like a first round pick. You know, he has not lived up to the hype, what they had hoped once they got him. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes with the little guys, you saw it with John Ross, you know, every, everyone hopes you get Deshaun. <laughs> but they're only like most of them have not lived up to the hype on the small little speed guys. Mm-hmm. If they could do that over, I think they would have leaned going a bigger to me. I would have want him with like an AJ Brown, a Devonte. you know, obviously you want those guys, but I'm just saying like a big receiver, big catching radius. Look at Mark Andrews, big, big target. And I think it helps guys that Josh Allen, I mean, you just get bigger targets a couple of years ago when they signed all the little slot receivers. I'm like, I don't like that. You know, sign it, Diggs has a big catching radius, mm-hmm. right? D- Devontae really helps Rodgers out. He's got a big catching mm-hmm. radius. DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, it makes it easier on your quarterback. You know, just just an easier target to hit because mm-hmm. the ball it's the farthest throw you're going to make, right? right? Deep outs, go routes, posts, stuff like that. When a guy can just go up and make Keenan Allen's a good example, huge mm-hmm. catching radius, and that's where I think they help with Bateman, adding Sammy, who's just you know, just gives them some depth for sure. Mm-hmm. Just a bigger body. Yeah. I'm assuming that's what they were looking for when they drafted miles Boykin out of Notre Dame, but he hasn't uh, lived up to what his size and athleticism should be able to do on this level, but so be it. Um, so let, let's go to uh, team outlooks. Uh, first one I got for you, um, the jets and Robert Sala, you're close with the 49ers and the guys in that organization. So, I'm sure you know a lot about him. And uh, What do you see? And I thought about this this morning. Rex Ryan walked in with the Jets and I think went to -to back-to-back AFC title games. Obviously, they're two different guys, but similar in the way that they are, you know, brilliant defensive minds who have the ability to really make players run through a wall for them, uh, players, coaches kind of guys. What do you think Robert Sell is going to be able to do in a division that probably is going to be tougher this year? Um, New England should be improved. I don't know how much. Uh, Miami looks like they're on the come up, and we'll talk about them in a second. And obviously, Buffalo is a class of the AFC East. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be hard. There's, the roster's not very good. They have mm-hmm. a rookie quarterback. They have first-time offensive coordinator, first-time defensive mm-hmm. coordinator, first-time head coach. It's a lot of moving parts. I think one thing they've lacked the last couple of years, you just watch them, like the effort, uh, just kind of a lethargic feel to the franchise. Mm-hmm. And can he just instill some energy? Because you're, I mean, it could be a long season. Like they, they mm-hmm. might win four games, right? right? So can you just keep playing hard? Can you keep swinging? That to me is the number one thing. Like I, I don't think I'm looking for, like I'm not expecting much. I right. mean, if you told me they don't win a division game, I think that's, re- yeah, that's possible, right? I mean, the Bills are a powerhouse. Like you said, Miami's good and the Patriots, it's going to be hard for Robert Hall to beat Belichick in mm-hmm. year one with Zach Wilson. Right. So it just, it's going to be a long year from a win loss perspective. My mm-hmm. guess would be it to me, it's just going to be positivity, keeping your head up, developing guys, showing young guys, taking strides, the quarterback getting better is it's, it sucks if you're a Jets fan, cause your team has been bad for a while, but that, those, those Jets teams Rex Ryan won with were good. 
You know, I mean, Revis Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. They traded for San Antonio Holmes. Mm -hmm. They had so many guys on defense that were. I mean, they had the. I think the top defense in the league. They had the number one yeah. rushing offense, if I remember correctly. Yep. Yep. They added LT. It was Thomas Jones? I mean, they they were just they were their offensive line was sweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it just it was kind of a ready made physical defense. And Rex is a good defensive coach, so I I I don't think this those two teams like talent wise. I don't know how many guys on this Jets roster would have started on that Jets team. Fair enough. Um, so let's go to Cleveland Browns. Um, Baker Mayfield got picked up for the fifth year option by the team, but I think I did read yesterday they're working on a new deal for him. Um, any chance that gets done, or are they going to kind of make him uh, make him earn it? And what do you see from the Browns overall this season? Yeah, my, my, my thing is, like I'd say this with Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, and Baker Mayfield. Now, obviously, Lamar and Josh have accomplished more than Baker. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, Mahomes is an outlier, right? He won the Super Bowl. He was clearly the best player in the league. I don't know what the rush is to always extend guys. Like mm -hmm. you got him on four, you know, rookie contract, and the, you're picking up the fifth year option. They're going into year four. Like I would let them all play it out. Let's mm -hmm. just see how it goes. Like what's the, what's the rush? You know, you're going to pay him a lot of money no matter what. You might as right. well enjoy being on the, the cheaper deal. And, I mean, Baker was the number one overall pick. Like, he mm -hmm. makes a lot of money. So, it's like, I'm, what what rush am I in to pay him, uh, especially based on really one good year? And I think when you watch Baker, relative to the other two guys that are having success in his class, like Josh and Lamar are big-time talents. Mm -hmm. Like, they just jump off the screen with their physical attributes. Baker mm -hmm. is really kind of, in my opinion, more of a product of a system. They have arguably the best one-two running combo in the league. Yeah, they have weapons everywhere. That scheme is very quarterback friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, their defense is getting better. Like I, I just, I don't, I, I would not pay them now. Now, especially because going into this season, I think we all agree the Browns have one of the better rosters in the league. Yes. Like he, he. Let's see him do it back to back years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I would advise against paying them for sure. Fair enough. Um, we mentioned this team earlier a few minutes ago, and this is one of the more interesting teams I see in the league, and that's Miami Dolphins. Uh, they look like they've built the right way. They look like they have the right coach and right front office in place. But there are doubts about the quarterback position with uh, Tua Tunga Bailoa. And like we mentioned, Buffalo is now the class of the division. Do you see Miami taking a step forward this year? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I actually think they might come back to earth a little bit. Like, I mean, having Ryan Fitzpatrick was a big stabilizing force for them, mm -hmm. and he was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I just think Tua is a great unknown. Was he injured last year? Yeah. But when he did play, and he was clearly healthy enough to play, he was healthy enough to be their backup from week one. So that tells you he wasn't that injured. He just didn't look right, you know, relative to the way NFL quarterbacks look physically. Something was just – it just didn't look very good. So I, I – now, I liked it in Alabama, like probably most people. I mean, he was an excellent prospect. But I, I don't know if I could feel confident saying that they're going to be some lock playoff team or even competing for the playoffs without – I got to see it from him before I feel confident mm -hmm. about their situation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, finally, for the first time in the Super Bowl era, we see a champion return all 22 starters with, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which is crazy. Um Assuming health, in your opinion, what is Tampa Bay's chances of repeating as champions? And is, is this the year that Tom Brady finally succumbs to father time? I mean, to me, the only way he is bad is he gets hurt because his arm looks the same. His mm -hmm. game is the same. Like nothing – he's been the same for a decade. Like his right. – part of what happened to Peyton Manning is he, his arm didn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, same with Drew Brees. Like his arm just – and, and both those guys never had powerful arms. Like Brady's arm, maybe it's not as powerful as it was in 07, but it's still pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. And their team is absolutely stacked. Mm -hmm. Not only they bring back 22 starters, to me, the key, they bring back their staff. Todd Bowles is the defensive coordinator. Yep. Their defense is awesome. You know, Leftwich and Arians run that offense. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's not just they run the offense. Now they run it with Tom. Like they're all on the same page. They know what they're doing. Mike Evans, they keep Godwin everyone's on the same page with what they want to do and what works in, t in big spots. So yeah, I mean, they, they're going to be a power, an, an absolute force. Honestly, if Tom like rolled his ankle and had to miss a month, like whether it's Kyle Trask or Gabbert, like they would still be a power because their defense is so good. And you just, their, their weapons are awesome. 
and their offensive lines now. I mean, they are – they're pretty good. Well, there you have it. Um, John, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join the Format Podcast, uh, sharing your insight, your experience, uh, your connections in the NFL. I really uh, appreciate you um, dropping the knowledge on us today. No problem. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, you too.